So welcome back, everyone. Um, so now we'll have the last talk of the day by Piotr Indyk, visiting us from MIT. Uh, all right. Uh, can you hear me well? All right. All right. So uh, the talk is about fast approximate algorithms for a chamfer distance. Uh, it's a paper uh, that will uh, soon appear in a new RIPS uh, 2023. 20, uh, it's a paper joined with uh, uh, these fine people. Okay, uh, this is uh, who they are. Uh, you know, just for the uh, clarity, uh, Sandeep is uh, the guy on the left. Uh, <laughs> the guy on the right is Max. Uh, he also contributed, but uh, he's not officially a co-author of this paper. <laughs> All right. So I guess uh, the first time you see this uh, uh, title of this uh, talk, right? I mean, the main question is, uh, was the chamfer distance, right? I, I kind of uh, kept it, uh, uh, you know, mysterious, right? I mean, there is no abstract, right? Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, who knows what's a chamfer distance? Okay, uh, okay so I guess uh, everybody else. Oh, okay. again. Eric did introduce in this talk like a day or two ago. Unless oh, I really? Who, who, who did it? Yeah, Eric. 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 Oh, yeah. Eric, all right, okay. Uh, Eric, is Eric here? He had to go. Oh, he had to go, yeah, all right. He, he not to raise my hand. I see, I see. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so some of you know, uh, most of you don't, right? So uh, I'm going to define it. It's a, it's a distance between uh, two uh, uh, sets of points, right? So I'm, I'm going to refer to them as uh, point clouds, right? Because that's, that's uh, often how they're referred to in uh, practice. Okay, so... Uh, you have two sets of points, right? A, the blue one, and uh, B, the red one. And uh, the chamfer distance is uh, from A to B is simply the sum of uh, all uh, points on the left of their distances uh, to their nearest neighbor. All right? So basically, it's the sum of all the points of the length of those uh, edges. So it's, a, it's a very natural notion. And uh, you've probably seen uh, uh, definitions which are at least somewhat similar uh, to it, right? So, for example, uh, a very similar definition is a uh, uh, Hausdorff distance, right? Where the only difference is that uh, the sum is uh, replaced by max, right? So this is the maximum uh, maximum distance. You know, here it's the the average or the sum of the distances. And of course, another very uh, similar notion is the F Huber distance, and I'm going to talk about it, uh, uh, you know, the connections in the, uh, in the next slide. All right. Now, uh, generally speaking, this uh, distance uh, function can be arbitrary. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, we just think about it as being L2 or L1, right? But, uh, you know, the whole notion and some of the algorithms are actually more uh, general than that. All right, so <laughs> and we're going to refer to it as a distance, uh, not a metric, right? Because it's not a metric, right? It's, uh, it's very easy to see. And actually, it's not a metric, you know, like there are not just one, but there are two strikes against it, okay? So it's not symmetric, okay, which is uh, very easy to see, right? Because uh, the distance from blue to red, right, is some of this. But, uh, oh, but if you want to compute the distance from red to blue, you have to include... Uh, you know, this distance, right? And, you know, it can be uh, much larger than uh, the other way around. So this is typically not a problem. If this is a problem, uh, it's addressed by just symmetrizing it, right? It's the same thing as for house of distance. Uh, so it's one reason it's not a metric. Another is that uh, there is no triangle inequality. It's also easy to see. Uh, <laughs> typically, people just ignore this fact. Uh, it's uh, inconvenient sometimes, but, you know, uh, what can you do? All right. So uh, this is the, uh, the definition. Uh, any questions to this definition? Because that's probably, like, the most important slide in the talk. I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly simple, yes? Do you get time to the after symmetrizing? I actually don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I don't think so, but uh, I, I don't know. Yes. Can you repeat the question for the, for the mic? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. So the, the question is, uh, do you get triangular equality after you symmetrize it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If somebody figures out during my talk, I'll, I'll, I'll appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? 
All right. All right. So I uh, already mentioned that the transfer distance is uh, quite closely related to earth mover. Uh, to the point that uh, it's actually sometimes called relaxed earth mover distance, right? And it's uh, easy to see why. Uh, basically, this is another way of thinking about chamfer distance, right? It's the minimum overall mappings from blue to red of the distance uh, of, the, of the sum of distances along the edges, right? And uh, uh, if you uh, restrict uh, this uh, minimum uh, so that uh, the functions are required to be one to one, okay, you get exactly the earth mover distance. Or to be more precise, it's a uh, uh, version over the uniform measure, right? You just assume that uh, it's an earth mover distance over sets of points as opposed to multisets or, or, or measures. Uh, so this immediately implies that uh, uh, this is a lower bound for this, okay? Uh, the gap can be large, right? It's, uh, it's generally uh, unbounded. But uh, this uh, relationship uh, makes it actually very useful in a bunch of uh, uh, applications. And uh, the reason is that, uh, you know, it's pretty clear from this definition that uh, this is much easier to compute than this, right? You know, this, you know, there is a trivial algorithm in dn square time. You know, this is a non-trivial optimization uh, problem. So because of that, uh, people often use uh, a chamfer distance as a proxy uh, for EMD, right, which is uh, easier uh, to compute, uh, to the point that uh, some papers, uh, in particular uh, these uh, two, refer to it as a relaxed EMD. Okay. A again, uh, modulo the fact that, you know, here defined it for sets, and, and this is the measures, but uh, other than that, uh, it's, uh, it's the same. Uh, However, you know, uh, uh, chamfer distance uh, has application that's uh, on the right, right? Connections to EMD is important, but there are many other, uh, there are many other applications. And uh, the applications kind of uh, varied uh, over time, right? So uh, maybe except for the last, uh, uh, like maybe three decades ago or two decades ago, uh, popular applications were to uh, measure similarity uh, or dissimilarity between uh, low dimensional shapes, right? So, you know, for example, here have an example, right? You have uh, one incomplete shape, you have another complete shape, right? You want to see how different uh, they are. I mean, you have to align them first, right? But uh, uh, modulo that, you know, it gives you some measure of uh, uh, dissimilarity for low dimensional points, uh, point sets. Uh, now, over the last uh, maybe 10 years, uh, another popular set of applications uh, went beyond uh, shapes, and uh, in particular involved uh, point clouds in uh, higher dimensions. Okay, so this is uh, one uh, example. How many people have seen this example before? All right. Yeah, it's a, it's a fairly, uh, fairly known uh, example. It comes from the paper from the previous slide. Uh, it's referred to as a word mover distance. Okay, so the idea here is that uh, you can take, for example, documents, okay, like this one, and uh, you can map each uh, word into a point in some relatively high dimensional space, right? You know, for example, using you know, word to vec embedding or, or, or something like that, right? You take a word and you uh, transform it into, uh, actually, I don't know what dimension is, 64 or, 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 or something like that. <coughs> Justin looks like he knows, but. Okay. Right. Yeah, so basically, uh, you can model a document as a, a set of points as a cloud. <laughs> in a high dimensional space, right? You know, two documents. And uh, then, you know, to compute uh, the similarity between the documents, you can just compute uh, some distance between those point clouds, okay? In the paper, uh, uh, the authors use, uh, ultimately, they use uh, earth mover distance, right? So hence the name word mover distance. But uh, it's not so easy to compute, so uh, they use uh, chamfer distance as a proxy, right? Basically, they have a pipeline. They want to find a set of uh, nearest point clouds, right? So they use uh, chamfer distance as a first approximation, and then, you know, they filter, and then they compute the actual worth mover distance only for a, a subset of the points. All right, so this is, this leads to uh, another set of nice applications, but at this time in high dimensional spaces, right? And uh, last but not least, uh, you know, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, people use the uh, deep learning a lot, right? If you, <laughs> if you didn't notice. Uh, and uh, uh, chamfer, uh, chamfer distance found uh, many uh, applications there. Uh, basically, in deep learning, you know, like whenever you want to predict or regress a shape, 
right? You, you have to have some no notion of uh, uh, distance between uh, the, uh, what you predict and the ground truth, okay? And people often use uh, uh, chamfer distance to do that, right? Precisely because it's a, it's, it's, it's a much more efficient than earth mover distance. All right, so it's been used around and uh, uh, it's been implemented in a bunch of libraries, you know, both for deep learning and uh, for comparing uh, point clouds, right? So it's a, it's a useful measure uh, to, uh, uh, you know, for various applications. <coughs> All right, so uh, how quickly can we compute it? Uh, so, well, let's assume for simplicity uh, the uh, sets A and B are both of size N in the dimensional space. And let's say that the distance is a Greenland distance over one, okay? So, you know, this is the trivial algorithm. Uh, despite the fact it's trivial, actually many, if not most, uh, implementations I've seen actually implement this, right? So, uh, uh, you know, there is nothing to say here. Uh, you know, however, already uh, uh, 20 years ago, people noticed that Okay, I mean, this is a pretty dumb uh, algorithm, right? Because really what you want is a uh, sum of all the distance to nearest neighbors. So we can as well, you know, use some uh, intelligent data structure, right? For uh, computing those distance to nearest neighbor. Uh, in this paper, uh, uh, these authors use uh, KD trees. Uh, you know, of course, now we have uh, many more uh, algorithms for uh, computing nearest neighbors. And uh, if you use uh, a state of the art algorithms, uh, you roughly get uh, this type of uh, uh, runtimes. Okay, I'm putting here runtimes for the one plus approximate uh, uh, nearest neighbor, right? Which I'm saying to one plus approximate approximation to uh, chamfer distance. All right, so in low dimensions, uh, you can uh, compute both build the data structure and make n queries in roughly this time, right? So it's a very efficient in terms of uh, n, it's like dependence is logarithmic, uh, but you have this uh, curse of dimensionality, right? And uh, 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 this might not be the state of the art. I think state of the art might have minus something here, but uh, it's you know approximately the, the state of the art, right? You you have to pay this uh, exponential dependence on the dimension. Uh, in high dimensions, uh, things are a bit different. Uh, the runtime is uh, no longer logarithmic, right? It's n to some uh, you know complicated looking uh, exponent. Uh, the basic idea is that this exponent is uh, smaller than one as long as epsilon is greater than zero. Right, so you get some sublinear time algorithm. Uh, it's not logarithmic, but uh, at least you are not paying exponential dependence uh, on the dimension. Okay, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this is actually the state of the art. Uh, like this is the best algorithm I have seen uh, in the literature. All right. All right, so uh, this seems like uh, something we should be able to improve, and uh, that's uh, exactly what we uh, what we did. Right, this is the uh, uh, state of the uh, this is the prior work. Uh, the main or uh, one of the uh, two results in our paper is a uh, one plus epsilon approximation in basically this time. Okay, so uh, you know we prove both over this and uh, and this. Uh, on top of uh, that, uh, the algorithm, the algorithm actually is, uh, uh, is fairly simple, okay? I'll, I'll explain it, uh, uh, you know, in this talk. And uh, it's not only simple, it's also, you know, clean, right? I mean, it's, it's easy to implement, it's uh, naturally parallelizable and, and, and so on, right? Uh, so, uh, and last but not least, it's uh, empirically fast. Right, so we are we are hoping that after proper implementation, uh, this thing you know could actually be used in a bunch of uh, in a bunch of places. Now, uh, crucially, I know that uh, uh, this algorithm here approximates the value, but uh, it doesn't approximate the correspondences. Right, there, there is no it doesn't return the assignment. Right, and uh, and this is like, there is actually a, a reason uh, for it. Uh, uh, basically, you can show that. Uh, a runtime, or uh, we show in the paper that the runtime of this form is uh, not possible to achieve, assuming a so-called uh, heating set conjecture. How many people have heard about heating set conjecture? All right, so a few fans of uh, fine-grained complexity uh, heard about it. How many people have heard about uh, orthogonal vectors conjecture? Okay, many more, all right. So, so this is uh, something which is uh, 
uh, it's a much stronger or, or stronger assumption than orthogonal vector conjecture. And, uh, you know, orthogonal vector conjecture is related to so-called a strong exponential time hypothesis, which in turn is a much, much stronger version of P not equal to NP. Okay, so like after, you know, you mentioned all this, uh, you know, after we do all the strengthening, right? I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, one can argue whether, you know, you should believe it or not. You know, whether you believe or not, at the very least, it uh, points out that, that there's some barrier, right? That uh, if you uh, get, if you improve over this, you know, you, you also uh, disprove, you know, some uh, conjecture that at least some people uh, believe. Okay, yes? I was curious, in like the natural language or other applications, uh -huh. are there some good settings where you don't need the mapping? You only need the... Right, right. So, uh, so for example, uh, in this setting, okay, so let's go back to the applications. Um, yeah, so here you don't need the mapping uh, because uh, uh, you use chamfer distance here uh, to compute the nearest neighbor respect to EMD. Uh, so what you really care of is the distance, right? And uh, you approximate this distance, the EMD, uh, using chamfer distance, right? You find uh, a few closest points respect to chamfer, and then you run EMD on it, right? So here, you, you, you just need the value. Uh, uh, here, uh, it really depends. I mean, uh, Often you don't need the correspondence, as uh, sometimes you do. Uh, for deep learning, it really depends, right? If you just use it as a loss function, then you don't need the correspondence. But uh, uh, but sometimes you need more than just the the, the, the value of the function. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I, I cannot really say uh, like what's the ratio, but uh, there are many many applications that I'm aware of that use only the value. Yeah, although often they, you know, let, let, let's not get it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, so these are the uh, the two results. Sorry. Yes. Can you say what does it mean you cannot get a? So when you say you cannot get a bound of this type, you mean n d polygon over epsilon or? All oh, right. Uh, so, uh, right, so the formally, uh, we can reduce a heating set problem to uh, this problem with uh, epsilon being one over polylogan. Yeah. So, so basically there is uh, an indication that already for, uh, you know, sub constant, but uh, not very uh, uh, big epsilon. Uh, uh, the running time has to be, uh, you know, quadratic, right? Got it. Yeah. So like two to the one over epsilon might be okay as still. Uh, but... Two to the one over epsilon. There is no evidence. Uh, there is no evidence for that. And what about dimension? Sorry about the. Uh, well, so the uh, heating set is hard already when dimension or conjecture to be hard uh, already for dimension being polylogarithmic. Yeah. Thank. You. Uh, yes. Sorry, maybe just a baselines question, um, and maybe I, I misunderstood. Why can't you use the nearest neighbor data structures to estimate each of the distances, like to a constant or a log, and then important sample and compute them exactly? Ah, so that, that's uh, essentially okay. what we are doing, okay. uh, right? As I said, the algorithm is not complicated, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that uh, in order to get this running time, we have to do something a little bit more. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. All right. So uh, what is the algorithm? Uh, the algorithm essentially follows uh, Aaron's suggestion, right? Uh, uh, with uh, one uh, twist that I'm going to get into uh, in a moment, right? So basically, we approximate. Uh, you know, we start by computing the approximation of the uh, distance to the nearest neighbor. Okay, so for each a, we get this uh, dA. Uh, the approximation is kind of funny in the sense that uh, we don't want to underestimate, right? So uh, uh, you have always this, this holds always. 
Uh, but uh, uh, in terms of overestimation, we only care about it being on average, right? Uh, and of course, you know, what you suggested also gives you that, right? Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, so we execute uh, this thing here. And uh, after, okay, I gave this talk earlier to uh, more applied people, okay, so there'll be some concrete numbers, you can just uh, uh, ignore them, okay? <laughs> so you, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure if theoreticians are uh, that happy with actual numbers, right? So you can, <laughs> you know, you can, you can, you can just, uh, uh, you know, uh, pretend they're not there, all right. So, uh, uh, right, so after you uh, perform this estimation, uh, what you do is uh, you uh, compute the, uh, basically, you know, normalize it so that this is a probability. Uh, and, uh, you know, each probability is proportional to the estimated distance. And uh, all you do is uh, sample uh, this many uh, points uh, from this uh, probability distribution. And uh, for uh, each point that you sample, you compute the actual distance. Okay. So basically, this is this is important sampling. Okay. And then uh, when you output your estimator, okay, the you know the standard thing important sampling is that uh, you basically have one. You know, here in the estimator, you have one over this probability, right? So that uh, the expectations in the expectation, you know, this and this cancels. And uh, uh, the expectation is the uh, is the correct one. All right. So that's uh, that's basically the whole uh, algorithm. Okay. Uh, All right. So uh, why is this thing correct? Uh, well, the expectation uh, you know, of this estimator is correct. You know, again because of standard uh, argument for the. Uh, uh, what shall I call it? Uh, important sampling. Okay, basically this and this are inverse, which means that uh, this thing uh, cancel out. Uh, variance uh, can be bounded as well, and basically the the bound comes from comes from this. Okay, uh, the, you know this factor here uh, directly com comes into the uh, bound for the uh, well square root of the variance, right? Which in turn uh, affects the, the running time, right? So this log n is basically this log n here. Okay, and uh, these are these are like uh, standard facts about uh, important sampling. Okay. So uh, uh, how much time does this uh, take? Right. So this you know clearly takes uh, this time, right? Because we are sampling uh, this many points, and uh, for each we compute the exact uh, distance, right? So it's a uh, dn. Uh, you could imagine a uh, faster algorithm, but for, for other reasons, it's actually plugging in some faster nearest neighbor algorithms doesn't seem to be uh, giving anything that we know. And uh, uh, what's the runtime of this? Well, we, you know, I didn't describe how this works, but uh, it turns out that the runtime is a dn log n, right? So you basically have dn log n here. Here you have dn log n uh, over epsilon square. And uh, uh, and that's how you get the whole algorithm. Yes. Would you use the nearest ever approximately with epsilon, like in the? Oh, oh no, you can, you can, yeah. So uh, this is basically your, your, your suggestion, right? Yeah. But before we get to uh, to that, uh, any questions about this? Like, if you ever seen important sampling, this 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 goes through uh, very. Soon. All right. So uh, the, uh, the the main question is how do you get this uh, crude uh, approximation to the sum or to the uh, distance to the nearest neighbors? And uh, uh, well, as you as you suggested, right? Uh, one way to do it is to basically build the nearest neighbor data structure with some crude uh, approximation, and uh, you know you just uh, query this, and and that's it. Right, so this uh, certainly gives you uh, this property, right, and also this property, right, because uh, all uh, distances are approximate up to log n. It's more than we need, but you know, certainly you get this. Yeah, the only problem is that uh, it's uh, tricky uh, to do it in exactly n d times log n time. Okay, uh, so the the uh, like the uh, I'm happy to be uh, corrected, but. Uh, uh, you know, like all algorithms that I'm aware of, you know, they have uh, runtimes which look like d 
n over 1c or, or, or things like that, right? You know, this is for L1. Uh, but uh, there are these pesky uh, logarithmic factors, right? Sometimes they're not logarithmic, sometimes they're n to small of 1. And uh, since we want to have a very fast algorithm, uh, you know, basically they just are compound. Okay. So uh, what we do instead is uh, uh, go back to first principles. Uh, the final algorithm is actually uh, quite simple uh, still, but to best some knowledge, we, we need to do something else, right? In order to, uh, something more, in order to get uh, uh, this uh, estimate. Right, so we go to first principles, uh, we get a weaker guarantee, right? Instead of uh, each uh, distance being approximated up to log n, we just get that the expected value of the is, uh, uh, log n uh, was in this, right? And then, of course, by Markov inequality, uh, you get a, a good approximation. All right, so how does the uh, algorithm uh, actually look like? Okay, it's a quite similar algorithm to, uh, if you've ever seen, uh, how many people have seen hierarchically well-separated trees? About a style, yeah, all right. Yeah, so it's a, uh, it's a HST, but that was a one twist. Uh, so what is uh, HST, uh, or what is HST uh, uh, restricted to this particular setting? Uh, it's basically a quadri uh, where uh, the point set, for a point set which is shifted by a random amount. Okay, you take your point set, you shift it by a random amount, and then you build a quadri, right? So what's a quadri, right? This is the uh, top uh, node. Right, uh, then you subdivide into four parts, right? So these are four other nodes. And you know, just keep subdividing this, you know, until you uh, get the leaves. Okay. Uh, so that's a standard uh, quadri. Uh, yeah, and then the distances, uh, you know, it's well known that uh, in, in some expected sense, uh, the distances in the between two points are well approximated by the distances in this quadri, right? When the uh, three edges have some exponentially varying uh, weights, okay? Uh, you know, alternatively, you can just think about it in, in this way, right? That uh, uh, for each point here, okay, you, uh, to approximate the distance to uh, nearest, nearest neighbor, right? You find the lowest level such that uh, the cell of this node contains a point. Right, and then you set the distance to be equal to this. Right, so basically for this point, okay, uh, you have to go to the top level to find a red point, right? So this could be this, but it also could be this. Uh, but for this uh, point here, right, you, you actually find a red point in this cell, so you can get uh, this as an approximation, okay? So this would be uh, pretty much like a standard uh, HST. Now, the, the only twist uh, that we make is that uh, unlike in uh, standard uh, HST, we actually use uh, different random shifts at every level. Okay, so it's not that uh, we shift once and then just uh, subdivide. Uh, we use uh, <coughs> different uh, random shifts at uh, every level. So you know, instead of uh, uh, this looking like this, okay, you can get something like this. Okay, it's no longer nested. So in fact, it's not even a tree at this point, right? I mean, it's a uh, uh, if you want to connect it to some weird graph, uh, but uh, you know you can see that uh, this definition still goes through, right? Basically, to find the distance, you just find the you know lowest level when you actually have some point of the other color, and then you 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 connect it. And uh, and that's uh, uh, pretty much it. Oh, by the way, I should mention in practice we just use standard uh, quadri, right? We don't randomize. You know, it didn't make any difference in experiments, right? So we just uh, keep it simple. But uh, for the analysis, it's, uh, it's uh, crucial. And uh, the reason why it is uh, uh, important uh, uh, is basically uh, the following, okay? So I'm not gonna give the full proof, but I'm just gonna give the intuition, right? So first we need some notation, right? So consider uh, some level, okay, which we are gonna parameterize by a scale. Okay, a scale is just a parameter. Uh, you can think about it as a, a scale uh, being proportional to the uh, diameter, right, of this uh, the grid up to some, you know, factor of D or so. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, for uh, let H uh, R of X, right, be the 
uh, grid cell uh, containing x, right? So each uh, hr corresponds to a level, right, of a scale r. And uh, for any point x, hr of x is the grid cell containing x, okay? Uh, then, you know, it's uh, uh, known, it's well known, it's very easy to see that uh, the probability of, uh, you know, for any two points x and y, the probability that those points uh, collide or not collide, you know, it's uh, closely related to the distance uh, between them. Uh, in particular, uh, if the scale is uh, much larger than the distance, right, so you can think that, you know, have two points very close and the grid cell is pretty large, right? Then uh, this uh, dependence of uh, uh, these two cells not being equal is a uh, linear uh, in roughly, at least bounded uh, from the above, you know, as a linear function of the distance. Okay. Now, you know, if this uh, distance, you know, grows, at some point it goes uh, beyond the scale, uh, then you have the opposite, right? Probability that uh, uh, these two points will actually fall into the same cell is uh, exponentially small. Uh, right, so these are fairly standard properties of uh, something like this, right? And that extends to like fairly general setting, uh, basically any, I mean, not quite, right? But essentially any local distance hash function, you can just uh, plug it here. All right, so, uh, uh, so let's say that uh, I consider one A and I consider uh, that B to be the true nearest neighbor of uh, A in B. Uh, then we know what you can see is that, uh, uh, you know, the typical situation, right, is that uh, uh, when the scale uh, is uh, around the true distance, then, you know, this uh, A and B collide. And uh, moreover, uh, no other point in B whose distance is uh, much larger than scale will collide with A, right? Because, uh, you know, this is dependence exponential, right? So once you exceed this uh, by log N, right, the probability of collision is uh, very small, right? So this is the, the typical thing, meaning that uh, this was what happens with a constant uh, probability. Uh, and if this happens, you know, uh, everything is good. And, you know, like you don't need this uh, independence of different levels, but, uh, you know, like the analyst also has to take care of the tail probabilities, right? So what happens if uh, uh, two points uh, start to collide only at the higher level, right? So they don't collide uh, at, this pro at, at their scale, okay? So then you have to go to higher level, and uh, having independence there, you know, just uh, means that probabilities multiply, right? So, uh, yeah, so in the end, you know, like you can write a bunch of unnested sums, okay, and you, uh, you basically, uh, using the, the same dependence property, you know, you get that uh, uh, the average distortion is the logarithmic. All right, uh, that makes sense. Are there any questions? Go ahead. Just making sure you get, we need the log n in order to get high probability and say that for every point, you get a good approximation. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit more complicated, right? Because at the end, we just care about the expectation, right? right. But uh, uh, in order to get this uh, expectation, uh, we have we have to be able to handle the the tail probabilities, right? right. So the the analysis is a point by point. Right, so so there is no union bound uh, at, at the end, right? But uh, you 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 have to be able to deal with a situation where uh, this uh, uh, first collision doesn't happen at the proper level, right? And and then you know, like if these things are independent, that you are unsure that okay, you go to another level, you get another shot, right? And you know, like very quickly, the probability uh, of uh, going very high uh, to get a collision it just uh, goes down very quickly. So maybe just thanks. So as a flip side to the question, we cannot guarantee that with a like with a large enough constant for every point you'll get a log n approximation. Uh, no. Right. And the, because that'll be that'll be against your lower bounds eventually. Uh, uh, because if we had that, you would have a mapping. That would and, be uh, well, I mean it would be uh, um, it wouldn't be against the lower bounds because we would get only log n approximation, right? Uh, a log n approximation we can actually get in, a, you know, if we add extra polylog, we actually can do it, right? Okay. So, uh, okay. uh, yeah, so we don't have a lower bound, but uh, the analysis doesn't go through. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, so this is uh, all I had to say about the algorithm or the analysis. Are there any questions? Yes. So instead of building a quad tree, right? One thing you it might be possible to do is to like make random choices along, <clears throat> excuse me, along each of the axes. But then would you lose the property that points nearby stay in the same cell across different levels? Is that what you need to do this type of thing? Yeah, basically, uh, at least for the analysis, you need to know that uh, uh, you know HR and let's say H2R, uh, they are independent. Yeah. All right, yeah, so at the end, it's a very simple algorithm. The analysis is uh, not complicated at all, right? Just a bunch of equations. I mean, honestly, this algorithm could have been discovered uh, 20 years ago. Uh, for some reason, hasn't been. Uh, so uh, you know, like we 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 are we are happy uh, we managed to, uh, to find it. All right. Uh, so that uh, concludes the uh, theory. All right. So I have to finish, I guess, in eight minutes. Right. Give or take. All right. So uh, uh, all right. So let me now uh, talk more about the uh, the applications. Uh, uh, okay, so this is, uh, uh, you know, like a prototypical uh, result uh, that we got. Uh, we ran this, uh, we implemented this, uh, uh, you know, by we, I mean, uh, my co-authors, right? Uh, we, uh, well, we, right? Uh, we implemented this, uh, uh, this uh, algorithm uh, and uh, ran it for uh, two types of data sets, right? I mean, you know, you have, uh, you know, 3D or, or low dimensional and uh, high dimensional. Uh, uh, data sets. Uh, for uh, low dimensional setting, we use the ShapeNet data set, uh, which is, uh, you know, a collection of uh, point clouds that uh, look uh, very similar to the examples with the plane, right, we have seen uh, earlier, right? So this is uh, one set of applications. This is for, uh, uh, you know, using it to compute distance between the uh, uh, documents. And uh, these are the type of results uh, that, we, uh, that we got, okay? We compare uh, our algorithms to uh, two baselines. Uh, one is our uh, KD3. I, I think it's a standard KD3 used in the MATLAB, if I remember correctly. It's a, a fairly standard package. And uh, we also compare uh, our algorithm, right, which is here, to uh, just a simple uniform sampling, right? And, uh, uh, you know, like, not surprisingly, right, with the, our algorithm is asynchronously faster than KD3. Right, you know, of course, you know it's a bit uh, apples to oranges, right? Because uh, this algorithm gets an uh, exact solution, right? Well, here we get approximate, but the you know the error is very small, right? It's like a few percent, so uh, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, uniform sampling, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, is uh, slightly worse. Okay, in the sense that uh, so what what it means is uh, you know basically we have to uh, we fix the error or the empirical error, and we uh, sample enough uh, samples so that uh, we uh, get the same error in both cases. Okay, so, uh, you know, important sampling has to pay for computing these approximations, right? So there is some, some fixed cost, but uh, then uh, you need fewer samples, right? So you, you basically get uh, uh, algorithms faster. You know, here the difference is not very big. You know, here it's like a factor of two uh, or something, right? And uh, you know, compared to uh, both, uh, in, in both cases, compared to KD3, right? It's uh, the the improvement is uh, uh, significant. Question? Yes. Did you choose the number of samples according to the to the analysis, or no. you chose it sort of optimistic? You chose it just right to get the right error. Yes. So basically, for both uh, uniform. Uh, and the uh, important sampling, we uh, uh, we chose it just right. Yeah. All right. So, in a practical setting, what would you recommend? What, what are you telling the practitioners? Uh, how, what are you What are you telling the practitioners to do? Sure. When they want to get an error that's small. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, uh, uh, ultimately, so you know, right, right now the code is uh, somewhere there. It's a code for the paper. Uh, but uh, ultimately, you know, like when we you know, actually release a code that we can, you know, like advertise. Uh, uh, we want to, 
uh, use this, uh, but I want to choose the number of samples as the analysis, right? So that we, we have a guarantee that uh, uh, with, you know, at least this probability, you are going to get at most this much error. Yeah, it's uh, a little tricky, uh, right? Because if you just plug in expressions, I mean, you know, there are uh, big old constants uh, all over the place, right? So this is, we, we haven't uh, done it yet, but uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the goal. Now, you know, I suspect that in practice, like especially for people who use it uh, uh, as a loss function, uh, no, nobody really will care. Uh, you know, we just basically said, you know, uh, let t be 100, right? And, uh, uh, and that's it, right? But that, that are, you know, like it's certainly much more, it will be much better, right? If we can get a similar, uh, uh, you know, good results while actually preserving the guarantee. So that's a that's an important issue. Okay, so, uh, oh, sure. So I guess from the previous slide, it, it seemed like the relative gap between the sampling algorithms and KD tree is sort of similar in three D and in high dimensions. And maybe I would have expected the gap to be a lot bigger in high high dimensions. Um, I if there's a reason. Uh, yeah, it's a good, uh, good question. Uh, I mean, right. So you are talking about the gap, not the actual, right? Because the yeah. sizes of the yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah my guess is that uh, what happens is that uh, both KD three and important sampling, but basically, I, 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 you know, my best guess is that uh, the approximations of the probabilities are actually. Uh, uh, better there than here, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So the runtime uh, is, you know, longer, right, uh, for KD3, but also the, the approximations here are worse. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, and I would need to double check uh, to, to, want to, to give us answers with confidence, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 Also, you know, this data sets, I mean, they're high dimensional, but there's a lot of structure there, right? So. Yeah. <coughs> Is that, uh, oh, sure. Follow up on my earlier question. So it, it seems not that un, I, I, it's a great algorithm. I, I, I like it. I, I, I'm concerned in the previous slide that, uh -huh. that when you actually, if you were to do it in, not in an instance specific way, but based on the, on the worst case analysis, right. that you're going to, that it's not going to uh, improve on even the, uh, on the running time for the ex exact algorithm, right? I Why? I, well, just I, mm -hmm. just I'm just wondering. I'm I'm, oh, I'm speculating. Uh -huh. Given that you have to, de you know, this mm -hmm. the dependence on epsilon right. and and uh, the big O mm -hmm. uh, constants that you know, how much room do you have? How much wiggle room do you have to get an improvement significant I enough see. to give up ex uh, the exact? Yeah, I see. I see. Uh, Right. So again, it, uh, it could depend on the uh, application. So, you know, like the answer is, you know, I don't know because we, we haven't done it yet. Right. We, we actually, you know, we're planning to, but, you know, at some point we have to submit the paper. Right. So. Uh, sure. It depends uh, on yeah. what I, I understand. Yeah. It depends mm -hmm. on what accuracy they're really looking for. And if they don't, if, if they don't really care about accuracy or if the accuracy can be, right. if the error, guaranteed error can be 50% or something like that. Right. But it, but it also raises this uh, another issue which maybe right. you can speculate on which is mm -hmm. is there is there some method like uh, some other stage of sampling that will give you a feel for that will, mm -hmm. that will gi give you better constants on, uh, on an instance per instance basis right right so um yeah so that's uh, effectively what we were trying to uh, do right we we, we try to uh, Estimate the variance as we go, right? Uh, yeah, but I mean, like, ultimately, it starts to get complicated, right? And uh, so we just uh, decided to, all right, so let's let, let's set the parameters and, uh, right? I mean, the you know, the only thing that I can say in the defense of this uh, approach is that, uh, you know, both this and this, uh, basically, we're using the same, right? For, you know, both the baseline uh, in for sampling and this, we, we are doing the same thing, right? Um, yeah, and you know there is a fair amount of we have a buffer, right? Because this error, you know, two percent. Uh, I mean, you probably don't need two percent, right? So we can get a much uh, 
faster algorithms, uh, you know, if we have a higher error, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, I we, we, we don't have these experiments yet, and uh, that's something that we'd like to do. Yeah. Uh, do you have some sense? Do you have some sense of how what fraction of this is spent in the first log n approximation, and how much is the is the exact computation? Uh, I have I have this uh, data, but uh, unfortunately I don't remember. Uh, yeah, sorry, but I don't think I have it. Yeah. Oh, actually, in a way, indirectly, uh, indirectly, and yeah, I, I have to finish pretty soon, right? Uh, yeah, so indirectly, the, this uh, slide, uh, which is basically the last slide, uh, uh, answers that. Um, so here, uh, we did uh, another experiment, right? Basically, uh, we compared uh, the quality of the estimation by, you know, our algorithm and uniform sampling. Uh, as a function of the number of samples, right? And, uh, uh, you know, as you can see, you know, the uniform sampling, the gap between uniform sampling and uh, uh, important sampling is uh, smaller uh, in low dimensions than in high dimensions, right? So, presumably, once you invert this result, you probably can get uh, some sense of the of the run times, uh, right? Uh, yeah, I we have those plots. I just I just don't remember them. Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, last uh, uh, thing that we did, you know, we cooked up a synthetic uh, data set, right? So so where the gap between important sampling uniform is the biggest, right? It's it's where the cloud point clouds that you compare have outliers, right? So uniform sampling is not going to find them, but important sampling does. And you know, so not surprisingly, you can make this gap uh, really large, right? Now these are synthetic data, so. Uh, uh, you know, this gap here is much bigger, but you know, you can see that the gap is also significant uh, for uh, All right, and uh, this is pretty much it, right? So, uh, this is what we, we have seen. Uh, this generalizes to weighted point sets, other distances, basically anything that supports uh, LSH. And uh, we are hoping that, uh, you know, if we work uh, in the implementation, uh, in particular, we'd like to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, what you suggested, uh, this potentially could be a useful uh, algorithm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we are not, not there yet. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions for Piotr? So you guys have this um, lower bound to say that you can't uh, construct an approximate mapping, right? Correct. Uh, so I guess I have two like questions vaguely in the neighborhood. Sure. Uh, the first is using a similar like fine grained complex analysis or something like that. Is there right. a notion of it, if you don't care about outputting the mapping, is like a better dependence on epsilon or is a better runtime otherwise possible? Uh, I see. Can, can you do better than dn over epsilon square yeah, log n, right? Yeah, we we actually uh, we actually don't know what the what the answer to it, right? You know, basically the problem is that the yeah you could you could imagine you know like uh, set epsilon to be uh, one over uh, poly n, right, and then uh, make some sort of reduction, right? Uh, we we don't we don't know. Okay. Yeah. And then second question is, uh, suppose you care about like a deep uh, you know the deep learnings SGD sort of situation, and you're yeah. able to, like a noisy gradient in the sense that maybe oh, you yeah. turn like a partial mapping from some points to some other points. Is there yes. any hope there that maybe yeah. yeah like a low variance partial mapping? Right. So uh, all the experiments uh, that I uh, showed here, they uh, basically apply to this uh, first two settings, which is uh, okay. It's gonna take a while before I get to this uh, slide with applications, right. So uh, both, you know, uh, experiments were here and here, right? Mm -hmm. So when, when you have uh, uh, actual, uh, you know, data, right? Uh, for uh, loss functions, uh, you are perfectly right that uh, basically, you know, you can plug this into the our algorithm into the formula for the uh, loss function. Uh, we have no idea how this is going to work, uh, right? So this is something that uh, we haven't. Uh, uh, tried uh, yet. 
physically. Everybody was busy with. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, this is uh, uh, one of two things that we want to look next. You know, just uh, take one of this. Uh, 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 you know, there's a bunch of papers which uh, do regression for for shapes, right? So uh, you know, basically just uh, replace uh, whatever. Uh, subroutine is being used with uh, our thing and see what happens, right? Uh, we have absolutely no guarantees that that's going to work, uh, right? Because uh, uh, we have no guarantees on the, uh, you know, that this mapping preserves the gradient uh, in any way, right? Uh, but, you know, like deep learning is uh, remarkably uh, robust, you know, and, uh, you know, es essentially what we need is uh, to get some uh, approximation of the direction, right? Because even if we get things wrong, uh, you know, we 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 can still improve it later, right? So yeah, so we are planning to do it empirically. We have absolutely no theory. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? So that's everything is geometric here, yes? Uh, Euclidean space. Uh, the way I described, yes. I mean, you could imagine uh, this, uh, this being some metric function. Uh, so, right? so could yeah. you, ex if you wanted to extend it to metric spaces? Oh, because so, some of these applications seem to be more like metric than geometric. Uh, which ones? I mean, distance between bags of words. Uh, oh, oh, I see. Well, I mean, it's a distance between uh, bags of words, but the, uh, you know, so chamfer distance is a metric, right? But the underlying uh, distance is a Euclidean metric, right? So uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I. So, so, uh, so this D in your case, in the so the, the analysis was using quartries, so you're using Euclidean space. Uh, right, so uh, I describe it in terms of quatris. Now, really, what you need, uh, all the way uh, forward, what you really need is uh, uh, what you really need is uh, this uh, HR of X, uh, right? So, you know, as long as you have uh, uh, some way of uh, hashing your uh, points uh, with this uh, property. Uh, everything goes through, right? Now, this means that you can use it for, uh, you know, like things related to jackal distance and whatnot. But I mean, really, it's like variance of L1, right? So, to, you know, to, to, yeah, so like in short, uh, if the underlying distance is uh, something more complicated than uh, Euclidean or L1 or, or something, something is, is this, uh, we don't know the answer. Okay. I mean, there could be for general metrics. I think there is a simple lower bound, but okay, I don't want to. Yeah. Any, any last questions? Uh, then let's thank Peter again. Now, now the schedule says uh, discussion. <laughs>